boy, oh boy, was I wrong. I got it wrong about Constantine. All these years, I thought Constantine was the bad guy. When it comes to Christianity, Constantine was actually their main cheerleader. We've all heard the story about the Council of Nice, where they came together and they decided that Christ was the son of God and Constantine made him a deity. But did Constantine really make Christ a deity? Was Constantine responsible for initiating the Christian faith? I want to talk about it. Let's go. This demonstration will show the procedures and techniques used by the operator. Welcome to the Ready Brew. My name is T. Edge, King Beaker for the Brew. And I'd like to thank you once again for coming on and just joining the conversation. Um, today, as you've already heard, we're talking about Constantine. What was his real impact on the Christian religion? I mean, we talk about it all the time, how Constantine came in and he began ruling the Roman Empire and he established this Christian religion for total domination. But I think that's the wrong idea. So who was Constantine? I'm not talking about John Constantine, the warlock witch guy from all the DC series. I'm talking about Constantine the Great, the Roman emperor from the fourth century, the son of Constantius, the brother of Constantius's other seven uh, children. Um, we're talking about the Constantine that had three children of his own that we know of. The Constantine whose mother, Helena, was uh, given the charge of finding the relics of the church. I'm talking about the Catholic Church to be specific. The Catholic Church, a.k.a. the Christian Church, a.k.a. the church that most of us are a part of today. His mother, Helena, was given credit for finding the cross that Christ was supposedly uh, crucified on. Um, the test that determined that it was the actual cross um, they found a sick woman in the kingdom they had these three crosses supposedly that they had dug up and they took this sick woman and they had her touch each cross um, and as the story goes she touched the first cross and nothing happened uh, she touched the second cross and still nothing happened and then she touched the third cross and magically she was healed. These are some of the things, some of the folklore that came out of the Roman Empire. Not only was she given credit for finding the cross that Christ was crucified on, she was also given credit for finding the nails that hung him to the cross. She was responsible for finding the rope that supposedly had him tied to the cross also. Um, this woman was put in charge of the, the treasury so she could do whatever she wanted in the empire when it came to Christianity. So she had churches established even in Egypt. See, a lot of people don't realize that Alexandria was the capital of Rome at one point. That is before they moved across the Mediterranean basin. You see, uh, Rome had its capital in Egypt, which is what Alexandria really was. Well, kind of. Rome's capital moved from Alexandria across the Mediterranean Sea into Italy. And that's where we now know where Rome exists. But yeah, Rome was, um, had its capital, I should say, in Alexandria, the same Alexandria where they're finding all the artifacts today um, under the, the ocean because this capital broke off and fell into the sea. But anyway, so um, Constantine. Constantine fell ill. And he went traveling around the Roman provinces, um, finding hot springs, finding mineral springs, everything he could think of to heal himself. And of course, it didn't work. Constantine succumbed to his illness. But, when he succumbed, 
the letter was sent and his kingdom was divided amongst his three children. Christianity was not the only religion of the Roman Empire at that time. Um, there was a religion called Zor Zoroastrianism. This religion was one where they worshiped an eternal flame. But this religion also had its roots in Persia. I apologize for the interruption, but just in case you weren't aware, Persia was first Babylon. And we know that Babylon was started by Nimrod because that's what Genesis tells us. It was also Assyria, and it happens to have been the epicenter of Greece under the short reign of Alexander the Great. I want you to make a mental note of all the images that you see. None of the kings referenced here have the look of an African. That's because Africans are not Hamites. The Babylonians, Assyrians, and Persians were Hamites, and the people of Iraq, Iran, and many other Middle Easterners are the true Hamites today, and that's according to scripture. I want you to do a Google search for the Kush mountain range people, or the Hindu Kush people. But let's get back to Constantine. And this uh, order of religion is also where the Magi come from. But along with this religion, um, there were church leaders who went to the Persian areas, today Iraq. Uh, they went and they made agreements and they set up churches in these areas. And these religions became a part of the Roman Empire. Uh, there's an account given by Socrates of where Buddhism first came into play. It also started around that same area. There was also a religion called Mithraism. Now, Mithraism was the worship of the god Mithras. Uh, this religion also had its origins in Mesopotamia, Persia, early Greece. And Mithras was the god of harvest. He was the god of cattle. Um, he was the god of fertility, the god of contracts. He had a lot of functions. But once the Romans got a hold of this religion, you saw Mithras depicted as um, a European figure slaying a bull. Now, I have my own opinions as to where this uh, imagery comes from. You see, the Hamites, the Bible, who the Bible says settled uh, the areas from what is known the Middle East, they all worshipped bovine deities. Um, it's still largely seen in um, areas such as India today. But... Baal worship was a bull god that they would erect a metal statue of and while the bull was being worshipped they would light a fire inside and they would place their children on uh, the bull's hands and the children would burn to death but um, the Egyptians also worshipped bull deities uh, you had Serapis you also um, had a depiction in the Bible of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt actually erecting a golden calf. So the Hamites had this common theme, this common uh, facility of worship. So a lot of people don't understand that
there's an account given by Socrates of the followers of Mithras actually uh, slaughtering Christians. It was all because the Christians went into a Mithraic temple. Again, I don't know if that's a word, but they went into a Mithraic temple. They desecrated it. Um, it's said that um, during this epic battle, I don't know how many days it lasted. He didn't give an account, but he, he did say that um, there were people killed in the streets. Um, there was one leader who was put in a cage and hung in the town square and actually starved to death. Followers of Mithras, they believed in human sacrifice. Um, there's an account given also of when Constantine's nephew was the ruler. Going inside of his palace, there, were, there was actually a, a corpse hanging with the innards removed because they would actually study the livers as the ancient Babylonians did during that time. Socrates gives another account of these worshipers of Mithras actually going and desecrating the grave of John the Baptist. The book is entitled, The Greek Ecclesiastical Historians of the First Six Centuries of the Christian Era in Six Volumes. This book was published in London by the Samuel Baxter and Sons Group, printed in the year 1843. Beginning on page 177 and chapter number seven, attacks made on the Christians by the pagans who had been raised to the power by Julian. At the bottom, it reads, at Ascalon and at Gaza, which are both cities of Palestine, they seized men truly worthy of the priesthood and women who had vowed perpetual virginity and after having torn open their stomachs, they filled them with barley and threw them to the pigs to be devoured. In Sebaste, a city of the same province, they opened the coffin of John the Baptist, burned his bones, and flung away the ashes. There was also, during uh, the time of Christianity's start, the worship of the solstices. This is largely where we get Christmas and Easter. You see, uh, during the winter months and the winter solstice, there was uh, no crops, no harvesting going on. Of course, it was cold. Um, they didn't have heaters back then. Um, and people prayed to God, certain gods to give them um, life and to carry them through this time of the year. We have um, this common term that we sing during the time of Christmas. We sing what are known as Yule Tide Carols. Many people don't know that the Yule log was actually the sacrifice of children. A Yule log was actually a baby. So when you sing Yule Tide Carols during Christmas, you're actually singing to Baal or in the, in the remembrance of these um, Baal worshipers. And that's something that you should be aware of. When Catholicism mentions that it is a universal church, it invited everybody in. So everybody brought with them their customs, their ideologies, their ways of worship. And the Catholic Church only took those things and tried to put Jesus on top of them to make them fit into a Catholic or a Christian ideology. Now, during the spring solstice, of course, this is when the crops began to grow again. Uh, this is when people started to be able to harvest again. So, of course, this was a time of replenishment. Um, they worshiped the rising of the sun. The detractors from the belief or faith in the Messiah try to use this as a way of saying that the Messiah didn't exist because the rising of the sun or Christ rising on the third day was actually from the pagan um, worship or ideology of the rising of the sun during the spring solstice. The reality is the Catholic Church did everything that they could to make people who came into their fellowship feel accepted. So what's the significance of being wrong? Well, for one, when you're wrong, you present the end correct information. And when you present incorrect information, 
you have a tendency to lead people astray. So for many years now, people have been led astray thinking that Constantine was this evil, corrupt guy who had an agenda to break Christianity. When in reality, Constantine was one of the greatest champions of Christianity. You see, his father before him was one who had a de detestation for Christianity. Is that really a word? I don't know. But anyway, Constantine's father had the greatest disdain for Christianity. And he tortured the Christians for all they were worth. But when Constantine became the ruler, he undid all the things that his father had done before him and those that came before his father. You see, Constantine rebuilt churches. He removed edicts from the books or struck away laws that prohibited the Christians from doing certain things in the kingdom. Um, he championed Christianity. That's even why they had the Council of Nicaea. So they had this meeting. He brought all of the bishops from all around the kingdom together. Um, these Christian bishops, I'm sorry, Gentile bishops, I might add. Um, he brought all of them together and they all made this decision to state that Christ was all existing. He was eternal and there was no way that he could be created. So here he was, this main champion of Christianity. And to think, he became a Christian because in a time of war, he said to have looked up in the sky and seen the cross of Christ and heard the voice of God tell him to march on and win the battle in the name of God. Now, how true that story is, I don't know. But I'm going with it because there's no way that someone would fight for a religion that they don't really wholeheartedly believe in. But anyway, you see, Constantine was a leader in Rome. But Constantine did not become a Christian so that he could be a great leader. Constantine became a great leader because he was a Christian. Constantine made concessions for everyone who was a part of the empire, all except the Hebrew people. He was, in fact, a Christian to the point that he was adamant about separating from the Hebrews because God had given the rights of Christianity to the Gentiles. So until the times of the Gentiles come to its fulfillment, we're going to always see a whitewashing of church history, especially from the Greek Orthodox position. I'm going to get into a study later about who, who the Greek Orthodox is, their relationship to the Roman Catholic Church, and their relationship to Protestantism. But for now, just to uh, conclude, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes. When it comes to history, nobody has everything together. You can get the greatest historian in a room, and because there are not records that they have access to, they're going to make mistakes. But when they find out this information, they're going to correct things. You see, the reality is that Charlemagne actually separated the Roman Catholic Church from the regular Catholic Church in the East. It doesn't mean that the Roman Catholic Church became something different than the Eastern Orthodox Church. It just means that there was a, there was a separation. There was a disagreement. There was a falling out. And to this very day, they're trying to work things out so that they can become one again. But that's not what I want to focus on. See, the reality is that Christ was not a created being. Christ was God incarnate. Constantine was such a devout Christian that he wanted to get this part of the story right because he wanted to make a great name for himself as a Christian leader. So as we go forward, we have to realize that when it comes to Christianity and who we are, what we stand for, this is a part of the backstory if we decide to hold on to that Christian title. 
So no, Constantine didn't create Jesus. Constantine did not create Christ. Now, was his name changed? Was his title changed to make him stand out and more appeasing to the Greek Orthodox Church? Is there a record of what his real name is? Or is his real name Jesus or Joshua as they claim today? That we may never know for some time. We have to know that we can't blame Constantine for uh, where we are in Christianity to make ourselves feel better. We can't say that Constantine was his bad guy and that the Christian faith that we follow now is not the same Christian faith of old just because we don't want to have ties to the, the old faith. The reality is that it's one and the same. There's no way around that. That is who, it, who we are if we are Christian. That's the end of my rant for today. What do you think? Do you think that maybe I've found some bad information and, and that Constantine was really the bad guy that um, he's made out to be? Do you believe that Christ was in fact a regular man who was a prophet who was made into a deity by another man who just wanted total control? Leave some comments down below. Let's discuss this a little bit further. For now, until the next time, peace.